morning. It looks like the waiting room has emptied out, and so we're ready to start on time. My name is Bob Hendren. Uh, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lawrence Fung, who is a child and adolescent psychiatrist from Stanford. I've known Dr. Fung for a number of years since uh, he, actually he was in training at Stanford, and we tried hard to get him to come to UCSF because of some of the interests that he'll tell you about today. Uh, before doing residency and child training at Stanford, he got his MD at, at George Washington University, a PhD uh, from Cornell, a master's from Hopkins, and then he started that career at Berkeley. So he's kind of come around to the Bay Area. Um, one thing I know he'll tell you about, but I uh, at least want to mention is the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit, which is uh, October 17th to 21st. And the talk that he gives today is related to that, to neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is something that over the last probably 10 years or 15 years has had a variable kind of response that some people have taken it one way, some taken it another way. And Dr. Fung has done more than anybody I know to help us really appreciate neurodiversity, its usefulness as a concept, and to use it as a, a kind of thing for good that really is very helpful in the center that he has at Stanford. So my pleasure and join us in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Fung. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hendren, for the kind introduction. It's uh, quite a privilege to be here. Uh, let me share screen. Last night, I actually gave a talk uh, to um, a class on autism at UC Berkeley, and. Uh, I was uh, showing my pictures uh, 27 years ago uh, when I graduated from Cal. Um, it was uh, felt like I was home, uh, although uh, we are talking uh, online. And so thank you for uh, waking up early and uh, come to uh, this presentation. Uh, today I'm going to be focusing on uh, neurodiversity in the uh, educational and employment setting. And, I, don't mention, uh, I don't know if I'm still turned on or not, but I should have mentioned, excuse me, Lawrence, for interrupting, that we're going to be doing the chat through the chat room. So if you have comments, questions, things to say, I'll be monitoring the chat room. And in the last 10 minutes of our talk, I'll be summarizing those to give to Dr. Fung. So please use the chat room because we're not all going to be able to talk except Dr. Fung. Excuse me, please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, okay. no problem. So um, in addition to, to my role um, as uh, director of the uh, Stanford Neurodiversity Project, I also see patients in the Adult Neurodevelopment Clinic, which is a uh, specialized clinic for people on the spectrum. And uh, I also uh, run a lab that uh, does um, research of uh, different kinds, mainly related to autism and some imaging work and uh, some uh, of the work that I'm going to talk about uh, today uh, as well as research projects. And uh, most importantly, I uh, got into this field because my uh, son is on the spectrum and uh, when he was four, he got the diagnosis, and after that, I decided to focus my energy on autism. Today, I'm going to um, first uh, kind of define what neurodiversity is um, for our purposes, and then uh, talk about strengths-based model of neurodiversity and how this is going to be applied to the Stanford Neurodiversity Project and then uh, I'll post the question, uh, how can we work together to maximize the potential of neurodiversity? So uh, like Dr. Hendren was uh, talking about neurodiversity, is really a concept. It's really uh, about regarding individuals with differences 
in brain function and behavioral traits as part of normal variation of human population. So uh, unlike um, 20 years ago, neurodiversity is almost um, kind of synonymous to autism. And right now, what we believe is that uh, when we talk about neurodiverse conditions, we often refer to autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and um, perhaps even more uh, than all those, uh, the, all those three uh, conditions that I mentioned. So this is a broad concept. And um, how common are these uh, conditions? Autism is about 1.9%, so um, one person in every couple of classrooms Dyslexia is much higher, 13 to 14%. And ADHD is about four, uh, 5 to 7%. So if you are uh, looking at this, uh, the neurodiverse conditions or people with neurodiverse conditions would probably uh, consider to be uh, the largest uh, minority group in the world. So when we are talking about um, the, the traits from uh, each person or um, uh, the, the, the traits to describe different abilities, we oftentimes use the bell-shaped curve and uh, the green zone is average on the right-hand side. There is more uh, high, uh, it's uh, above average. And uh, if someone is representing um, this area in the red, in the right, uh, on the right side, um, they are kind of in the uh, genius level, and on the left side, um, they are considered as below average. And one thing about human abilities is that we oftentimes use IQ, and right off the bat. I just want to say that this is very limited, and I'll tell you more about that, but we'll uh, kind of use this as an anchor point. So if average is 100 and from 85 to 115, this represents the 68% uh, of the people that are considered as in the average zone. The, in the, uh, as just like what I said on the uh, right-hand side, like if someone is 130 IQ, uh, then that person is considered to be pretty smart. 145 is like in the genius level. In contrast, on the uh, left-hand side, if someone is in this yellow zone, um, that person would be um, considered to be below average in IQ. And below 70 would be considered as um, intellectual disability. So this is very limited because there are a lot of things that are not captured in the IQ test. So Howard Gardner at, at Harvard University uh, had proposed the theory of multiple intelligences for a good 25 years. And instead of only focusing on uh, the visual, spatial, verbal, linguistics, logical, mathematical domains, he also uh, included other domains such as musical, rhythmic, bodily kinesthetic, naturalistic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and existential. So uh, interpersonal is basically the ability to relate to other people, and intrapersonal is ability to understand self. So um, to illustrate how this uh, um, a theory of multiple intelligences is used, uh, we can look at someone we know uh, very well, um, Albert Einstein. His um, profile would look like this. So musical rhythmic, probably close to above average. He at least uh, played the violin, visual spatial, and uh, there's no doubt that he's um, at the genius level. Verbal, linguistic, not so high. He actually didn't speak until four. Logical, mathematical, probably like 15 standard deviation above everyone. Naturalistic, probably average. Intrapersonal, actually, more like below average, and interpersonal, potentially even lower, according to what we read from the history books. And body kinesthetic, probably average, at least he um, rode the bicycle. So then when you are looking at this profile, what is striking to you is that he is 
uh, very high in some areas, uh, but there are also some areas there uh, that he is actually not high at all. But when we remember Einstein, we remember his abilities to be able to change the world because of uh, what he's good at and not what he is having challenges with. So basically, um, other uh, people uh, like Einstein, um, such as Alan Turing, Nikola Tesla, uh, Temple Grandin, Charles Darwin, is uh, Lewis Carroll, Andy Warhol, and others uh, in the entertainment industry, we can see that they, they all have some traits of autism. Uh, we cannot really give them diagnosis, uh, except for a couple of people here that they receive diagnosis uh, of autism. And their uh, a really common denominator is that they have very, very deep interests and they uh, spend time developing their, uh, their interests and to the point that their deep interests become something that is so remarkable. And it's not only in the sciences, technology, engineering, medicine area, but also in the um, humanities and arts, such as uh, Andy Warhol is the father of pop art. Lewis Carroll uh, wrote the Alice in the Wonderland and uh, people in the entertainment industry. There's uh, basically just no one um, stereotype um, occupation that we should be thinking about um, as long as uh, these individuals are really uh, leveraging their deep interest into something that is remarkable. And there are also other others like, um, for example, Jay, Jay Lano, Whoopi Goldberg, and um, Sir uh, Jackie Stewart. Uh, Car this is Dr. Uh, Carol uh, Ryder. Uh, so Jackie Stewart is uh, the the person that won um, the Formula One racing uh, many times. And um, Dr. Uh, Carol Greider won the Nobel Prize um, with uh, Dr. Blackburn at uh, Johns Hopkins um, for uh, their uh, discovery of the enzyme telomerase. And here we have um, Dr. Stuart uh, Udowski, who is, uh, used to be the chairman of the Menninger um, Clinic at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So uh, all of these uh, people, uh, in, and also this one is uh, Dr. Cosgrove in uh, Cleveland Clinic, they all have dyslexia. And they all um, turn out to be uh, leaders in that field. And there are some other uh, examples for people with ADHD, uh, such as Michael Phelps, uh, Simone Biles, uh, Will Smith, um, Karenine, uh, Kar Karina uh, Smirdoff, Sir uh, Richard Branson, and Howie Mandel. So neurodiversity can uh, be viewed as a competitive advantage, and only if we know how to leverage um, the characteristics of these uh, brilliant individuals. So when we are thinking about uh, autism, we oftentimes would uh, say we observe perseveration, and this is considered as a challenge. However, if the outcome is uh, positive, we call it persistence instead of perseveration. Similarly, seeing big picture is a common challenge, but if the uh, context is really about solving a problem that require details like uh, debugging a program, you want that person to focus on the details and not the big picture. Sim and similarly, individuals on the spectrum have few interests, but when they have interests, they really get to the depth of the knowledge. Perspective taking is challenging for them, but uh, they are very concrete and honest. Social interactions are uh, oftentimes not their uh, strong suit, but they can be uh, the most loyal friends. Similarly, for ADHD, impulsivity um, is common, but uh, the flip side is that these people uh, with ADHD have uh, the ability 
to, to make decisions rapidly. Hyperactivity uh, can be a challenge, but uh, it basically get the person to have high energy. Difficulty focusing on tasks that are not uh, in, that they are not interested in, but when they are interested in the topic, they are actually going to be hyper focusing on it. Distractibility is a problem. Uh, oftentimes, it brings them with creativity, and indeed, creativity is uh, one of the uh, most talked about uh, positive traits of uh, ADHD. So um, there are also other um, characteristics such as resilience, multitasking, big picture thinking, cool in a crisis, that um, sounds like someone uh, that, uh, that is managing a company like a CEO uh, would need to do. So, and indeed, there are uh, quite a few individuals um, like Dr. Sir uh, Richard Branson has ADHD. Um, so when you're looking at this, uh, this slide, as well as uh, the, the slide before, um, what we can see is that these are all the same characteristics. However, if the environment is allowing uh, the person to develop their, themselves and we help them to do so, what you're going to see are going to be strains. If the person is going to be told that uh, whatever they are doing is actually uh, or on the negative side, then they are going to be considered as challenges. So these, these are all the same characteristics. The characteristics of autism has not changed. But notice that they can actually, the people on the spectrum can leverage their characteristics to really build a, an identity that is more healthy for them because they can actually contribute to the uh, society. So similarly for uh, ADHD, uh, we can say very similarly. And uh, dyslexia is not quite uh, the same story because uh, we, it's not exact one-to-one -one, um, kind of contrast between challenge and um, strains. What, what we can say is that people on, uh, with that dyslexia, they have challenges with reading, writing, spelling, time awareness, and rote memory. But at the same time, many of them are very good problem solvers. They're very creative, observant, and they are very good socially. And um, to use the um, acronym Mind Streams, basically is uh, this encapsulates uh, what the, the dyslexic advantage uh, is according to this group dyslexicadvantage.org um, have posted so mind uh, stands for m i n d which are material interconnected uh, narrative and dynamic reasoning so now i'm going to uh, talk about the the strength-based model of neurodiversity. So unlike the disability model, it's really about focusing on the traits. So hyper-focus, attention to details, deep interests, and so forth. And this is actually not a new idea. Um, even in the very beginning when Leo Kana uh, uh, first described his uh, first 11 cases uh, of um, children with autism, he actually described that about half of them have very good memory skills and what, about one third have good musical skills. Similarly, Hans Asperger uh, also saw uh, two out of the four uh, of his um, first patients that he described as having good memory uh, skills. And later on, um, others are also describing something that, are, that is very similar. Um, and I'd like to point out that Rapin in 1996 had uh, 51 cases of people with autism without intellectual disabilities and 125 with intellectual disabilities. And what you can see is that uh, even uh, when, when you're looking at these uh, two numbers between with doubt and with intellectual disability, uh, they, they are not really that um, different in many ways. So what I'm saying is that 
you know, when you're uh, looking for the uh, the strains, you're not only seeing these strains with uh, people on the spectrum without intellectual disabilities, and they and Rapin found uh, the strains in memory, music, um, reading. Um, calendrical uh, calculations and dates and spatial skills and fine order skills. And so you can see the same categories, um, same domains of strains uh, are also seen in people that have intellectual disabilities. So what does that tell us? One thing that uh, we often see or we often assume is that when someone has intellectual disabilities, they, they are going to be having a lot of problems uh, with many different uh, ways. And we oftentimes forget about actually assessing uh, their strains in many other ways. So uh, say for example, uh, there are uh, people that, um, that are doing actually very well with painting and uh, and uh, performance in uh, of musical instruments, and uh, they do have intellectual disabilities, and some of them are nonverbal, and um, and then they become very very uh, much a high level artist when they are actually allowed to develop their strength. So it's very important for us to think about uh, opening our eyes on appreciating the strengths of people um, that are in the entire spectrum, not only the, uh, the people that seem to have the higher IQ. So I interrupt you again for just a second, uh, Lawrence, I'm sorry. Uh, someone had pointed out to me that uh, for the chat room, for me to be able to collect all the questions, comments, that you should address your chat to me, not to Dr. Fung or not to the whole group. So this is Bob Hendren speaking. You'll see me there. But so that, that I can collect all these, if you would send them to me, that some people have been instructed to do that and others haven't. Sorry to keep interrupting you. But oh, no problem. So the strength-based model of neurodiversity has uh, four major components. Um, and I'll talk about them a little bit more as uh, we go in the next few slides. The first is positive psychology. Second is positive psychiatry, and then Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, checkering seven vectors of development. And we also want to emphasize that neurodiverse conditions are conditions instead of disorder. We want to acknowledge the challenges instead of deficits, because the same challenges can be flipped uh, to strains if the person is allowed to do so. And we want to apply the strain-based model across the entire spectrum of neurodiverse conditions. About 20 years ago, uh, Martin uh, Seligman and Mihai Chaksen Mihai uh, introduced the, the field of positive psychology. And this paper has been cited for about 17,000 times already. And they um, basically uh, introduced the, this idea with uh, positive psychology having the core of well being, contentment, satisfaction. Flow is basically immersing oneself in an activity and get satisfaction out of it, and also happiness, hope, and optimism. And because this is such a good vibe, there is, it is becoming more and more popular way of uh, practicing psychology. And uh, uh, there were uh, 53 public, uh, published definitions in the last 20 years. But to kind of uh, summarize what's the essence of it, it's really three words, it's about strains, interests, and development. And I'm a traditionally trained psychiatrist, uh, and now I'm uh, trying to kind of advocate for positive psychiatry. And uh, positive psychiatry is uh, really about positive attributes and strains uh, versus pathology and understanding risk factors. And we want to understand protective factors and neuroplasticity in positive psychiatry. Traditional psychiatry is uh, using is uh, oftentimes treating the patient uh, by symptom relief with medications and short-term psychotherapies. In positive psychiatry, we try to use uh, psychoeducational interventions to increase the well-being and growth of that person. 
which can last for a lifetime and it can be considered as a preventative uh, approach. And this uh, is often ignored in traditional psychiatry. The, um, one major component of, chicken, uh, of uh, the positive, um, I mean, the strength-based model of neurodiversity is the Chickering seven vectors of development. And the seven vectors are basically the developmental milestones, uh, including developing competence, managing emotions, moving through autonomy toward interdependence instead of only independence, developing mature interpersonal relationships, establishing identity, developing purpose, and developing integrity. So when we are looking at this, uh, these seven vectors, we focus, uh, we ask three questions. One is, how can we help the neurodiverse individuals to achieve these developmental milestones? The second is, how can people around these neurodiverse individuals such as the school officials in uh, educational setting or the employers in the employment setting, how can, they can actually make the, uh, the environment more neurodiversity friendly and uh, also help these uh, individuals to achieve their uh, potential uh, and um, achieve these developmental milestones. The third is, well, what about mental health providers? What can we do to help the neurodiverse individuals to achieve these um, developmental milestones. So just to kind of illustrate how we use the um, strength-based model of neurodiversity, uh, neurodiversity SBMN. So uh, for neurodiverse individuals, we, we want to uh, help them uh, with focusing on their strengths and uh, want to help them with uh, uh, developing their uh, they're uh, basically making them a healthy, strengths-oriented people. And uh, we want to do that by raising awareness of their personal strengths, increase their trust in personal ability, help them with uh, learning to engage in relationships, increase their self-satisfaction through success. And it can be uh, very useful in moving um, neurodiverse individuals away from the negativity and in mobility. So instead of uh, focusing on their uh, uh, the anxiety, depression, their executive dysfunction, we can focus more on developing their strengths. And um, basically, uh, ways that we can do that is to uh, really focus on deliberate, uh, de deliberately uh, articulating how to build strengths, utilize their interests, and we can use positive behavior supports and also use universal design for learning. S something that uh, can be further illustrated is uh, in the educational setting, um, there are some um, schools in uh, Oregon that have started using the string-based IEP. So basically, uh, for those people that don't know, IEP is Individualized uh, Educational Plan for uh, people um, that have uh, that meet uh, certain criteria and uh, this public schools would need to uh, abide to the plan that they all uh, create and as a team and then um, and then they can help this the student accordingly so what we can uh, do is that if we identify and promote the student streams and uh, Determine what they can uh, that can they can do in order to, um, or uh, what they can do, and also how this environment can be changed in order to help the student. So uh, I'm going to just pass this very quickly, and say uh, between uh, the uh, the strength based assessments and the traditional deficit based assessments in school, you can see a very drastic uh, contrast. Um, it is rather demoralizing by, by using deficit-based uh, assessments and it reduces motivation and is very, very stigmatizing versus the strength-based approach is going to highlight the, uh, the strengths and abilities of the uh, individual and take into account all the environmental factors and sustain the strengths instead of fixing problems after issues arise. 
So um, there are many string-based assessments that are already existing for many years. So we don't actually have to play catch up. And one um, example here, uh, say for example in uh, IEP, there are oftentimes IEP goals. So the uh, traditional IEP, for example, can say, uh, this is an example by May 15, Ilana will know from memory all products of two one-digit numbers with 90% accuracy in four out of five tries. This is a very common way of phrasing a, uh, a goal. But if we use a string-based approach, we actually can say Ilana will use her skills with a times table to help transition by May 15 to um, knowing from memory all products of two one-digit numbers with 90% accuracy in four out of five tries. So basically articulating exactly what streams they are using, they, that can go a long way. And this uh, can be uh, done in many different ways. I'm going to just skip the other examples. So, um, so in the classroom level and in the uh, school level, teachers can actually change the environment for the good. And so um, now I'm going to uh, use the last 20 minutes or so uh, to talk about the Stanford Neurodiversity Project. So uh, in the um, beginning, what we uh, really believe is that in order for neurodiversity uh, to be exercised as a uh, concept that can uh, be effective, uh, we have to change the culture. So we have to establish a culture that treasures the, the strengths of neurodiverse individuals. If we do that, then we uh, can uh, very conveniently empower neurodiverse individuals to build their identity be, uh, based on their strengths and also enhance their long-term um, daily living skills throughout, throughout their lifespan. And uh, because initially we were thinking about doing it at Stanford only, and uh, uh, now not anymore, we want to attract talented neurodiverse individuals to study and uh, work at Stanford. And now we're uh, exercising all of this um, wider than only in our campus. We want to train uh, talented individuals to work with neurodiverse population and disseminate the model as widely as possible and ultimately, we want to maximize the potential of neurodiversity, not only for neurodiverse individuals, but for all of us, because there, there's so much that they can bring to the table. So our, uh, we have just about um, 30 people or so now uh, in our team. We have five people that are uh, full-time uh, in this project. And uh, there are four tenets of this uh, neurodiverse, Stanford Neurodiversity model. The first is education. We want to educate the public as well as uh, the neurodiverse individuals. We uh, collaborate with the de uh, various departments on campus and service agencies as well as companies on uh, the service. Uh, services would include like um, uh, helping people with uh, getting jobs as well as mental health support. And uh, we collaborate with the legal scholars and people in, um, that are in uh, the government to, uh, to work on certain efficacy uh, initiatives, as well as uh, making sure that the, the things that we do are evidence-based. So research is the fourth tenet. So when we are looking at uh, how to help a neurodiverse individual, we think of an ecosystem that includes many people, such as the family, friends, mentors, therapists, and in the educational setting, uh, other people such as the teachers, coaches, classmates, roommates, as well as the school officials and school community. And in the employment setting, similarly, uh, the supervisors, job coaches, colleagues, and executives, work community, and other uh, supporting communities. So you can uh, see that um, there, there are many people that are in this ecosystem that we are trying to target. And there are three initiatives uh, in this project. The first is Neurodiversity Awareness and Education Initiative. 
The second is Neurodiversity at Work and Wellness Initiative, and the third is Neurodiversity Independent Living Skills Initiative. And for each initiative, we have various different programs that are uh, that we have developed. The first is a special interest group that uh, we have um, been running for the last three years, and this is actually the kind of the uh, precursor of the uh, the Stanford Neurodiversity Project. Initially, we thought it's going to be just a um, grassroots effort, and very quickly it grew um, in the last three years. Actually, our first um, um, special interest group meeting, we thought we are only going to have like a few people, five people or so. Uh, we have 23 people showing up, and now our distribution lists uh, have uh, accumulated and uh, we have about 500 people on our distribution list. If you are interested in uh, joining our monthly meeting of this special interest group, uh, let me know uh, you, or you can go to our website to sign up. So uh, basically every month we have a uh, uh, an individual that's knowledgeable in some aspect of neurodiversity that will talk about uh, either employment issues, and uh, student support or mental health support. Um, this is another uh, a few, few slides to illustrate that we are building networks with uh, various groups and companies. So uh, the next couple of slides, I'll talk about the student support program. So uh, basically, uh, it is a comprehensive program that has many different components. And uh, uh, the first thing is we train the peer mentors who are Stanford students, and they can help the neurodiverse Stanford students to, on uh, transitioning to college from high school. They help them uh, with independent living skills as well as social skills. We refer students um, that will need accommodations to um, Office of Accessible Education. Uh, we also refer students to Schwab Learning Center for Learning Support and the Career Center for Career Development Support. I also direct the Adult Neuro Development Clinic, which uh, provide the mental health support. Um, I also teach with uh, several others a, a series, uh, a seminar series at Stanford that's uh, about uh, neurodiversity. And that uh, course is basically uh, covering uh, many different aspects that are not covered by uh, the other components of the student support program. So um, I'm going to skip this slide to save time. So basically what uh, we have uh, is that each neurodiverse student in our program will have two support circles. The first uh, support circle is the academic life support circle with these uh, people, learning specialist, career coach, and career mentor. And uh, every student has a Stanford Neurodiversity Project staff um, working with him or her. And uh, per, per, the other support circle is the non-academic life support circle, which include the personal counselor and uh, peer mentor that I uh, mentioned earlier. And sometimes the family uh, as well, especially if the student uh, wants us to continue to work with the family. The second major program is Neurodiversity at Work program. And basically the uh, gist of these uh, few points is that uh, we are providing support to neurodiverse individuals individuals that are um, in various points of the employment cycle. And at the same time, we are also supporting the employers to build a, a neurodiversity friendly workplace. So um, we got a, a grant from Autism Speaks uh, earlier this year. And uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, build uh, this um, specialized employment program that starts with uh, the candidate registry that uh, uh, basically uh, allow us to evaluate the um, participants uh, or the registrants. And if they are not job ready, we'll send them to pre-employment training 
or internship. Uh, if they are job ready, then they can, can be uh, matched to uh, the jobs in the job bank. And uh, what we make sure is that the job bank is going to have jobs that are in neurodiversity friendly workplaces. And if they are not neurodiversity friendly, then we can give training to the employer. And the, uh, uh, the beauty of this is that uh, the, because these people um, would have, uh, or the employers would have bought into um, a specialized way of assessing neurodiverse individuals, we can arrange accommodated interviews for these, um, uh, for in this process. And I can talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And basically we uh, provide um, uh, various different support at various stages. And um, before that slide, I'll just mention that this is from our website and uh, interested uh, individuals on the spectrum can come to our website to uh, uh, sign up for the registry or uh, participate in our candidate registry. And uh, employers can come to this website to get more information about our program. So um, on one hand, in our program, we are supporting neurodiverse individuals on pre-employment training, uh, internship, um, job search, pre prepare them with interviewing, hiring and onboarding, and even after uh, onboarding, uh, they are going to be supported uh, for three months in this very critical transition period. In parallel, on the employer end, we provide uh, neurodiversity awareness training. Uh, we help the, uh, the employers to figure out exactly how to uh, word their uh, job posting to make it more neurodiversity friendly. We also help the team, uh, not only the supervisor, but the entire team on how to uh, say interview uh, the neurodiverse individual. And uh, this is uh, very important because 80% of uh, the people on the autism spectrum are unemployed or underemployed. And mainly because they don't really get uh, to um, be interviewed sometimes. And even when they're interviewed, they often are just written off very much prematurely. So that's why we need to train. It's on the webinar too. Which one? Yeah. It's uh, UCSF. Um, so um, in, in addition to the, this uh, employment team best practice training, uh, before the on onboarding of that, uh, if someone is going to be hired um, from the candidate registry, we are going to also help the employer with building a neurodiversity friendly environment even before the onboarding. And uh, after onboarding, we will help the employers uh, for three months in the transition period. So we uh, want to emphasize this uh, part because we have a a very elaborate program for this 12 week uh, uh, period for both the neurodiverse uh, individual and the uh, employer. So like the students, the neurodiverse uh, employee also have two support circles. The first is the workplace support circle that have the team manager, the HR manager, a team buddy that can help the neurodiverse individual every day and um, the neurodiversity at work mentor who is someone that's outside the immediate team that the uh, uh, employee is working in. And we have this uh, SNP coach um, for the team, for this employer end, as well as the coach for the neurodiverse employee end, uh, who will also interface with the personal life support circle, with the personal counselor, and sometimes the family. So this is uh, a slide about the 12 week program. And uh, very quickly, I'm just give, giving you a- Like an iceberg, some communication between people is clear and easily program. seen, the part of the iceberg above water. But some communication is there, like the ice under the water, but not always as easily perceived, especially if you don't know to look for it. You can think of this communication as the hidden curriculum. 
Why is it important to understand the hidden curriculum? Because humans are inherently social beings and reliant on social interconnectedness for survival and to get along. At work, we may not rely on communication for our actual survival, but we do need to understand it for many reasons. Knowing the hidden curriculum can help us avoid mistakes. Understanding it allows us to accurately interpret situations and get help when we need it. Understanding the hidden curriculum can help you make decisions about how you want to interact and how you want to communicate and be understood. So how is the hidden curriculum communicated? Often it comes in the form of body language, slang, gestures, facial expressions, and tone of voice. Picking up on the hidden curriculum can be especially difficult when you're in a new environment. It's not uncommon for people who are neurodiverse to have difficulty understanding nonverbals, reading facial expressions, interpreting sarcasm or idioms, or dealing with social situations and office politics. So what can you do? Get support from a mentor? That may be your supervisor, a team buddy, an HR manager, or someone else at work. Review employment materials and standard operating procedures. Communicate about your behavior and what it means. For example, you might say, I don't tend to make eye contact. It's not comfortable for me, but here's how you know I'm listening. In the end, the choice is yours. You may want to get support, adapt to the norms of the environment, or create understanding and acceptance. Whichever choice you make, remember, bring your strengths. Maybe it's persistence. Maybe you can sustain attention. Maybe you're detail-oriented or you have a deep knowledge. Maybe you're a concrete thinker, you're loyal, and you communicate really clearly. Whatever it is, bring your strengths to understanding the hidden curriculum. So I'm going to just very quickly say that uh, in, so the uh, the last slide uh, the in the video is really focused on the um, neurodiverse employee and that's one of some of the educational components uh, in the curriculum and for the employer side we also have uh, this uh, uh, like a, a different set of training uh, on different areas and uh, we spend half the time talking about uh, the um, the day-to-day -day, uh, work with uh, the neurodiverse employee and the other half of the time some special uh, some specific topics that can be helping uh, helpful for the employers so in summary neurodiverse individuals uh, offer much to organizations if given a chance and they have uh, specific challenges that can be overcome the strength-based model of neurodiversity encompasses um, this positive psychology, positive psychiatry, chickering seven vectors of development, and um, um, theory of multiple intelligences. And um, the Stanford Neurodiversity Project is designed to maximize the potential of neurodiversity by practicing um, the strength-based model of neurodiversity. So uh, how uh, I'm inviting you to uh, to join uh, us in this Stanford Neurodiversity Summit in just about like like 11 days or so. Um, the theme is scaling up the Neurodiversity at Work initiative, and uh, we have about 83 uh, speakers uh, plus moderators. So far, we have more than 1,700. Uh, people already registered. Um, this talk, uh, this summit talks about many different aspects. So uh, I, I'm just going to invite you to go to our website uh, to uh, explore what may be of interest to you. And uh, just want to um, uh, to invite you also to join the special interest group for neurodiversity. And if you would like to let us know about your interest in neurodiversity and let us know about 
uh, any neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse individuals you know that are looking for employment, introduce us to groups or organizations interested in learning more about neurodiversity. And uh, those that uh, would be interested in hiring neurodiverse individuals and tell us how you want to be involved. By working together, we can make a difference to the neurodiverse community and beyond. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you uh, for your attention. And here are some of our uh, uh, supporters of this project. Thank you, Dr. Fung, for an outstanding presentation. I, just everything from your content to the quality of your slides, I thought it was just fabulous. And um, it's such a good thing you're doing. It just feels good uh, to see what you're doing. There, we've had a few questions that have come in. One um, would like to know, they, thought, they also commented on your slides being clever and useful, I think was the words they used. And uh, really liked the one on challenges and assets in ADHD. Uh, which they said really hit home for them. They wondered, are the slides available or? Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to share a, a version of the slides. Yeah. And how would they get that? Uh, should I send it to Gina? Yeah, I think that'd be great. And Gina can, I'm volunteering Gina, but she usually does that. So I think she'll be okay with that. Uh, another question uh, had to do with, um, this seemed uh, so great in the way it was targeted for people with autism, to dyslexia, to ADHD, to a variety of other things. But the question had to do, what about it being applied to other conditions that even might be core morbid, like schizophrenia or psychosis spectrum disorders? Do you have any experience or comment on that? Well, um, what I can say is that uh, this specialized employment program Actually, it's not a new concept. Uh, even um, I think uh, just about maybe two years ago, there's a, a paper in um, JAMA Psychiatry uh, talking about a specialized employment program for uh, veterans with uh, PTSD, and they do have problem with uh, getting work and. They have a specialized employment program that's uh, helpful to get them work. Uh, they are not using a strength-based model, um, but uh, it is a specialized employment program. The last question I have right now in the chat box has to do with, um, does to get into the program, do you need a formal diagnosis? Um, and, yes. And some of that, does that have a, making the formal diagnosis, does that cause some controversy with neurodiverse individuals who maybe don't like um, a diagnosis as kind of defining them in some ways that they, they don't quite mm -hmm. like? Yeah, so because the, this study uh, is a research study, so uh, basically is supported by Autism Speaks and uh, we uh, we are needing to have um, the diagnosis of autism. So some documentation uh, will be needed. And um, and I, I think uh, the, the people that come into our study are self-selected because they feel comfortable that they uh, disclose their diagnosis. And uh, in the employment setting, um, because of the labor laws and uh, so forth, uh, it is actually going to be help, more helpful for them to have disclosed their diagnosis in order to receive their uh, accommodations. But um, in but kind of in contrast, uh, not about the uh, the job. Uh, I mean the neurodiversity at work program. In our, our philosophy is that, uh, it, at least for the overall, we think that uh, the diagnosis should not be needed. At one point, we shouldn't need people to tell us uh, their diagnosis. 
like in our uh, student support program, actually we don't require students to tell us their diagnosis. And um, they oftentimes would tell us anyways, but uh, we actually don't have that requirement because we know exactly that uh, there are a lot of people that actually would need help and they don't want to get help because uh, they because they don't want to be labeled to have uh, to, um, autism or other conditions. I just am so impressed with how far you've taken this program. It's uh, just really, really a nice job. You have a great group of people that you're working with and you've done a, a marvelous job in being a leader of it. So thank you so much. Um, I would encourage us all to applaud again. and. I see that Gina and Nicholas have both come back on so they can say anything. Is there anything you guys want to add in our last 30 seconds? Uh, no, we'll, uh, we'll get the slides from Dr. Fung and we'll distribute those to everyone who registered after the event. Great, thanks. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here.